Armored Core Law, the story of Armored Core. It begins in the year ED070, when the Earth suffers a massive population growth, with little space left on the planet to home these people and a future of being starved for resources. The world's government proposed the building of underground cities to make room for this new growing population. By the year ED096, powerful corporations and world powers would then turn to space for an answer, as the population never stopped growing. To answer this, the first Mars terraforming project is executed. A pioneering fleet equipped with artificial intelligent robots is sent to Mars to begin planetary remodeling. However, the project would take too long, as by the year ED100, the Earth began to fall apart. More than half of the large cities in developed countries have become slums, while ever-increasing crime and shrinking investments have created a hollowing out of the economy. Industrial companies have been competing with each other for the interests of developing countries, and with the development of the new technology, problems such as the rise in temperature due to the increase in carbon dioxide and the increase in harmful cosmic rays due to the expansion of the ozone hole has become increasingly worse. The developing countries also lost most of their concessions to corporations from developed countries, and in addition to environmental destruction, they have been unable to solve the basic problems, such as economic disparities that will never be filled and food shortages caused by the population expansion. This causes discontent and grievances in many countries with environmental pollution that has halted the Earth's natural ability to cleanse itself. Soon, distant organizations emerged in various regions and garnered a lot of support. The spark to this war was small. It was a statement by a supporter of a developing country that terrorism against a major power was acceptable. Feuds between major powers and developing countries became evident, and other powers began to interfere with them. Soon in the name of eradicating terrorism, the major powers began their march, and developing countries requested the assistance of third world countries, leading to skirmishes that should have been mere local conflicts to quickly spread and flare up around the world. The people's discontent exploded and riots broke out in many countries, with the economic disparity as among nations becoming clear, along with the various other problems such as resources, territory, ideology, ethnicity and religion all erupting into a major war involving all. This would force the hand of the major powers of the world to race to the idea that they would end the war in one foul swoop by developing large-scale weapons with destructive power far beyond that of nuclear weapons. However, this war was different from the wars of a century ago, because now other countries had also brought out similar weapons, and the fields of battle became more like a weapons testing ground. Blasts and booms came from all over, and in the end, these large-scale weapons would turn everything into dust. The destruction of the natural environment could not be stopped, as these weapons of justice rained down on the earth, leaving only a few survivors. Their planet ruined by war, the survivors had no choice but to make their new homes in the underground cities that were once going to solve the problem of overpopulation, now becoming their only hope. It would take until ED 107 before social systems would begin to develop and expand among several underground cities centered on Isaac City. In this process, several large corporations take the lead in reconstruction projects as a replacement for the nation that collapsed due to the Great Disruption. This group would become known as the Union of Corporations, and with their mines and cash, they would stabilize the environment of the underground cities by ED 110, and exchanges between underground cities would become more active. This growth came thanks to the Union overcoming the biggest technological hurdle at the time to increase the mobility of the work equipment. The answer to this problem, which seems obvious to mankind, must make the most effective use of its remaining resources. As such, it developed humanoid machines that can withstand practical use. These would become known as muscle tracers, and their use quickly spread as the system was used in the resource mining and was later adopted in space exploration, which has been stagnant. This looked to be the fresh start for mankind, as such the research and advancement of MTs took procedure over everything else, and within a short period of time it made drastic progress. This progress would be the core concept or core system a standard for general purpose work equipment that could be actively responded to any situation by connecting various attachments via turret points on each part of the core. The corporations of the Union designed and produced various parts under this common standard, which was applied to many fields, including military. The MT's inherent versatility led to a rapid shift in the entire weapon system, leading to these new MT's with the core concept turning them into fully armoured machines of war. These would start to be produced as armoured cores. 
With such a force behind them now, in EDO 115, the coalitions of business propose major projects focusing on the comprehensive development and operation of the entire underground community. It would be a plan that progresses, expanding the functions of the underground city while at the same time making economical disparities become more noticeable between the population. It also caused conflict with the union of corporations with the need to grow and profit. They formed the raven's nest as the spearhead of intercorporation conflicts. It becomes home to a large number of ravens and for a short while would fall under the command of Chrome, one of the corporations within this union. It's within the next 15 years that out of the union, two of the corporations would experience rapid growth, Chrome and Murakuma Millennium. These two would advance their research faster, their MT's development would expand, as well as their businesses. By ED 130, these two corporations controlled most of the underground cities. The union would fade into the shadow of these two mighty corporations, and Raven's Nest would now have a new operator, one that neither Chrome or Murakuma seemed to question. It's during this time a new raven would join the ranks of Raven Nest. Their motives are known, yet the actions of this raven change the very world. It's here history will tell of two tales. The first of the raven who sided with Chrome. This would see the raven take on missions for the Chrome Corporation. These would include a reclaim oil facility, attack urban center, as well as a range of attacks against the space station and lunar base of their rival Murakuma. This path would lead the raven to give Chrome all the power it would need. However, the story would not end well for them. It can be said the same for the raven if they choose to work for Murakuma. In a series of missions that will see them take down Chrome's own private terrorists, the fall of Chemical Dico's experiment, and finally the end of Chrome itself. The most important part of this tale, however, is that this raven will down the second rank raven, becoming a powerful foe, and it's this new strength that frightens the true mastermind behind all this. An AI, said to be controlling the top rank raven, Nineball, as well as a range of its own MTs in its own private force. It's seeing the power of this raven that made the AI see them as a threat to the world they wanted. As such, the final mission, Destroy Floating Mines, is nothing more than a trap to kill this raven threatening to ruin its perfect plan to guide humanity. However, the raven will not die here. Instead, taking down the two nine balls that act as guards to this AI, the raven and the AI would finally come face to face. A machine built to guide humanity and a human who wanted to be free. The AI asked the raven what they wish for. The answer is clear when the raven destroys the AI, causing the underground cities to suddenly stop functioning and the largest corporation to fall in ED 158, leading to a new period. The period would become known as the Underground War, where after the fall of both Chrome and Murakuma, the smaller companies at the time began to battle for power once more. They wanted to run the cities like Chrome and Murakuma did. As such, this war would last a long 29 years, before in ED 187, the birth of the Underground World Ceasefire Commission would handle the ceasefire in the Great Death's War, and along with the ceasefire, the Treaty of Zizics, a war treaty, would be signed. While the contents of this treaty is never shown, by the year ED 0188, the Underground World Ceasefire Committee was scheduled to be dissolved after the ceasefire process was complete, but it was decided to continue in order to rebuild the inner company information network and reuse company-owned land. The committee would concentrate the military forces of the reigning organizations and would become a powerful controlling force. This would evolve into, by ED 190, to the Earth Government, led by the Underground World Ceasefire Committee, founded with the goal of restoring human life. The Earth Government advocates a return to the surface in order to break through the extreme exhausted situation of the Underground World. It begins to investigate the above-ground environment, and just one year later, in ED 191, the Earth government, having determined that it is partially habitable on the ground, promotes the migration of people to the ground. In the end, it seemed some of Earth's population would return to the surface. However, it was then, a few years later, a new and upcoming corporation would present the idea of living on Mars. They're called the Doomsday Organization, but have very little on their Project Phantasma. 